Hello, and welcome to another edition of Coffee Talk with Immigration Attorney Brian D. Lerner. Uh, in this particular episode, I'd like to talk about inadmissibility. I have a lot of people that uh, over the years have come into my office and they are uh, unclear as to why they can't adjust status or why they can't counsel or process or why uh, they are ineligible to uh, come to the United States. Some are married to U.S. citizens, uh, some have been petitioned by employers, some have been uh, petitioned by other family members, whatever it is. Some have won the diversity lottery. Uh, whatever it is, uh, there seems to be a, a basic misunderstanding many times as to what inadmissibility means and so I thought that I would uh, do a video try to clarify this list the grounds of inadmissibility and make it so that it's a little bit clearer on why and how these uh, grounds of inadmissibility come about so let's just take a, a normal example so I can uh, clarify at least the initial issue now let's say that you know, somebody comes to the U.S., uh, they marry a U.S. citizen, and they apply for adjustment of status, okay? Uh, and let's say there's no other problems. Well, then they adjust status, they get their green card, they're happy, and they, you know, uh, live their lives happily ever after. But unfortunately, most of the people who walk through my door uh, is not quite that easy. Um, what happens is there's certain things that have occurred in the past that make it so that they are inadmissible, meaning that they're not allowed to adjust status. Uh, inadmissible is really what the word means. They are not admissible, they are not permitted to legally either come into the United States or to adjust status because of something in the law, in immigration law, that uh, they did, which, uh, which basically makes it so that they don't qualify. Now, I'm going to give you the grounds of inadmissibility, but keep in mind that with many of these grounds of inadmissibility, there are waivers. Okay, and what are waivers? Well, let's say you're inadmissible under a particular ground. Well, if you don't do anything else, that means you're not coming in. Okay, but uh, if, if a waiver is permitted, then, you know, this whole package gets put together, you know, when, when I do it, it's attorney cover letter, declarations, affidavits, all kinds of other stuff. And what happens is it then uh, gets submitted to immigration, and if they approve it, they essentially say, okay, uh, we'll forget about this ground of inadmissibility and we'll let you in, okay? So being inadmissible is not in and of itself the end of the road. Uh, what, it, what it does mean is that if there is a waiver, not everything, uh, not everything has a waiver, but if there is a waiver, then it is permitted uh, to submit it and then you might be able to come in. So what are the grounds of inadmissibility? Uh, where, what, what exists? Well, let me just go through some of them. First of all, there are health-related grounds of inadmissibility, okay? Uh, if somebody has a communicable disease uh, of public health significance, then they are inadmissible, okay? And the, the question is, what exactly are those? <coughs> okay, a lot of these grounds of inadmissibility, just so you know, when I argue uh, it, let's say there's no waiver available. What I try to do in some cases is argue they don't fall under uh, the ground of inadmissibility because sometimes immigration will make too broad of a uh, scope of what is and isn't covered under the particular statute. So uh, that, that's pretty much how that works. Now, there is another ground of health, health-related ground of inadmissibility. Um, if somebody uh, does not have vaccinations for different types of uh, diseases, then they also won't be let in. So basically, if you don't have vaccinations for mumps, or measles, ru measles rubella, polio, tetanus, 
diperia, di, uh, diphtheria, uh, influenza type B, hepatitis B, um, or, and then this is sort of the catch-all, or other vaccines uh, that can stop or prevent diseases recommended uh, you know, by various doctors, then that also makes one inadmissible. Um, there is also, and, and this is sort of one that doesn't have a definite uh, definition of one whether one falls under it or not, but if it is determined that there is a physical or mental disorder of the person and it may pose a threat to safety or welfare of others, then uh, that can be a ground of inadmissibility under health-related grounds. And again, with, with this one, uh, many times I will argue that their particular disorder is not a threat to uh, the general public. And then, you know, I get various psychological reports, psychiatric reports, and so forth to prove um, or at least to convince why uh, the, the client doesn't fall under that particular ground. Now, on a lot of the health-related grounds, there is a waiver for these particular grounds of inadmissibility. And uh, you can prepare the waiver, even if you do fall under it, you get the waiver prepared and you uh, submit it and hope that it gets approved. Um, there are some exceptions, for example, the immunization requirements doesn't apply to children 10 years or younger, um, sort of a small exception, but uh, nevertheless, it, it is uh, an exception. Now, what is another ground or another uh, category of inadmissibility? Well, uh, the next one would be criminal and related grounds, and that's a big one. There are a lot of people who are inadmissible because of crimes and, uh, you know, unfortunately, even if they were committed many years ago, uh, you could still be inadmissible. Now, a lot of people come to my office and they say, well, you know, I committed the crime, I was, you know, dumb, I was, I was young, I just did it, and I served my time. Now they put me in deportation proceedings 10 years, 15 years later, and it's not fair. I've already served my time. I mean, isn't that, and then they throw the term at me, isn't that double jeopardy? And I, I tell them, no, it's not. Um, they did, under the laws, uh, the criminal requirements as imposed by either the state law or federal law. Um, and now, under immigration law, they are suffering the consequences of inadmissibility uh, or removability, depending. And so, uh, it's not double jeopardy, um, and you know, just because you committed the crime and served the time, doesn't mean it disappears. Okay, so what are what are the criminal-related grounds of inadmissibility? Well, one is uh, a crime involving moral turpitude. Okay. Um, oh, and by the way, of any of these crimes, if you admit to the essential elements of the crime, even though you don't have a conviction, you're inadmissible, okay? Um, just so you know, and I'm not telling you to lie or misrepresent in any way to any immigration official, but if, if for example, you're at an interview, and, and I can tell you where this comes up, uh, let, let me tell you the next ground of inadmissibility for crimes. It's, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a violation uh, related to a controlled substance, okay? So this happens a lot. They'll be in a foreign country, they'll have no criminal record whatsoever, and they'll be getting their medicals. And the doctor will ask them, will say, so, have you ever uh, used drugs? And, and the, the person will say, well, well, you know, five years ago I smoked marijuana, um, you know, a couple times, but that's it. Well, the doctor puts that in the report, the report goes to immigration, immigration opens up the medical record, they see that the person admitted to using uh, marijuana, boom, the person's inadmissible, even though uh, was never arrested, was never caught by the police, was never convicted, they're inadmissible. So obviously um, admitting to the essential elements of a crime uh, is not the best thing that one would want to do, okay? Um, so what, uh, what other grounds of inadmissibility exist? Well. Uh, there's uh, certain grounds where uh, there's multiple criminal convictions. 
um, if uh, somebody uh, was convicted of two or more offenses, um, regardless of whether the conviction was in a single trial or whether it rose from a single scheme of misconduct, um, where the offenses involved moral turpitude, okay, uh, for which the aggregate or the total sentence to confinement were five years or more, is inadmissible. Now, there's a lot of uh, little subsections to that category of inadmissibility, so that's why it's really important to bring this particular um, information to an immigration attorney who knows what they're doing to determine if maybe the crimes you committed don't make you inadmissible, okay? Um, sometimes it's inadmissible under one section but not another, and obviously if there's no waiver, again, you have to try to argue as best you can that they, that, you know, you are not inadmissible, okay? Either way, there's ways of, of going about it. Now, there's other grounds of, uh, other criminal grounds. Uh, one is that the crime was committed, um, you know, when you were under 18, so where I was just talking about the multiple criminal convictions, if one was committed while you were under 18, okay, um, more than five years before uh, the application for the visa and so forth, uh, then that can't be used as one of the multiple criminal convictions, okay? Now, I know that we spoke earlier about the uh, controlled substance, um, but that's a big one. Uh, drugs are a very big uh, crime or as far as immigration is concerned for inadmissibility. So, um, you know, if you're a trafficker, uh, controlled substance trafficking, any anybody who is known or, or the Attorney General, you know, the people who work for the Attorney General has reason to know that the person is a controlled substance trafficker is inadmissible and you know sometimes people will try to get around this by listing a drug that they're saying well this can't possibly be uh, considered to be trafficking because it's not a controlled substance uh, but they uh, to be honest they list uh, any substance as defined in section 102 of the controlled substance act and they list pretty much everything under the sun there so it's difficult to uh, to get around that one and just so you know if uh, you were in a better aider, a sister, conspirator, colluder with anybody who was actually convicted of drug trafficking, you're also inadmissible, okay? Um, now, there, there are uh, other grounds as well, you know, for example, uh, you are the spouse, son, or daughter of an inadmissible person under these drug trafficking grounds, and within the previous five years, you obtained any financial benefit from the illicit activity of the drug trafficker or should have known about it, uh, then you also are inadmissible, okay? And as you can see, there's lots of different criminal grounds of inadmissibility. Another is uh, prostitution and commercialized vice, okay? Um, another, and um, by the way, there again, there's various waivers for these, but uh, that's another one. Um, or you coming to the United States to engage in any other unlawful commercialized vice, whether or not it's related to prostitution, is uh, is inadmissible. Um, now there's uh, a waiver that is authorized for different paragraphs of the this particular section. And again. Make sure you go to a criminal, uh, sorry, to an immigration attorney that knows what they're doing. When you come to me, I have to analyze the particular crime to see if it is or isn't under. That's why a lot of times, if you just, you know, send an email or just request that, uh, you know, they go, well, I got convicted of this, am I inadmissible? It, it's not that easy. Uh, we have to analyze it under all of these inadmissibility statutes, and we have to see if. Uh, number one, if we can get it under one, if it clearly is making you inadmissible, if it gets under a waiver. So when you have a waiver 
generally it'll give the definition of what's required. You usually have to have some U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident relative who will suffer extreme hardship if you're still considered inadmissible. And then it's like a scale. You put the good stuff on one side, the bad stuff on the other. Okay, so that's a whole nother video, which, which I've done a few on waivers, but uh, this is uh, grounds of inadmissibility. Now, other criminal grounds of inadmissibility are significant traffickers and persons, okay? Slave trade, sex trade, uh, all of those uh, will make someone inadmissible. Um, other ones are money laundering, okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, it seems obvious, but you don't want to launder money, okay? Uh, it gets into mafia and, you know, RICO actions and so forth. And other security uh, related grounds. If you're a security threat to the United States, obviously you will be inadmissible. Um, and then there's there's different uh, different catch-all phrases they use. You know, or the uh, actually there's one section that says any other unlawful activity. Okay. Um, uh, or you know, trying to export from the United States goods, technology, sensitive information, espionage, sabotage. Uh, you know, terrorist activities, you know, all of this stuff obviously makes someone inadmissible. Um, you know, usually someone doesn't come in the door and say, I, you know, I'm a terrorist, uh, am I inadmissible to the United States, or, uh, you know, I'm planning on committing espionage. So they have to have it in there just in case, but uh, those are the obvious ones uh, and so forth. Um, and so those are the basic criminal grounds. Now, there's also uh, different other grounds of inadmissibility uh, such as fraud okay if somebody commits fraud and misrepresentation uh, they are also inadmissible and you know just an example somebody comes into the US with someone else's passport or with someone else's green card or with someone else's visa documentation whatever it is um, in those particular cases, that person committed fraud. Even though they came into the U.S., were admitted in the U.S., it was under fraud. So if they ever want to adjust a consular process, they do have to use a, uh, they do have to get a waiver for fraud. Because there, there is waivers for fraud, which is good. Um, okay, and then uh, other ones, uh, if the, just a regular petition, if the, petitioner doesn't make sufficient money. They're inadmissible as they could become a public charge in the United States. And again, there's ways around that, you know, finding joint sponsors and, uh, you know, showing that, uh, you know, if there's no joint sponsor, trying to show five times the liquid asset amount of the poverty requirement and, and so forth. So uh, there are uh, all different grounds of inadmissibility and so even though I've gone over a lot of them and some of them may or may not have made sense what I want to impart here is the knowledge that there's lots of grounds of inadmissibility but there's also ways around arguing that you're not inadmissible there's ways around getting waivers and and statutorily they take into account uh, you know whether you're inadmissible they take into account the age, health, family status, assets, resources, financial status, education, skills, um, you know, all these are taken into account and so that's why we, we always need to make a very persuasive argument as to why we believe one, you're not inadmissible or two, why the waiver should become, uh, you know, should be granted. Now, there's different categories where to, to, to muddle the waters up a little more um, where depending what one's qualifying for or what type of visa they're coming in one thing might make them inadmissible but on another ground it might not for example let's say it's a VAWA application you know battered spouse petition and let's say that part of the reason that somebody did what they did is they were afraid they were going to be beaten by their spouse Okay, if you can show that link, then uh, you won't, you know, that doesn't make one inadmissible, okay? And, of course, that's just for, for that. And there, there's, there's different other examples as well. Um, okay, so all in all, 
uh, I hope that you're able to, to see uh, what I'm trying to, to show you here and uh, if you like the video uh, you know subscribe to me and also uh, call my office for a consultation or go online you know, I have clients all over the United States uh, and in many countries around the world no problem I give Skype consultations uh, in one evening to you know five different continents it's, it's kind of neat how that works uh, so feel free um, okay more on the coming videos